Good morning. It's exciting to be in God's house, isn't it? That's right. He's waiting for us to worship him. So I hope you're ready because he's waiting. Let's sing to that awesome God. Let's stand together, please. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, what an exciting morning. I'm so thankful for our worship team and them leading us and singing songs of praise to our awesome God. What a privilege it is that we have to meet together. If you're visiting with us this morning and maybe this is your first time with us or maybe you've been here before but you have not filled one out yet, we would love to connect with you. And so if you could fill out this guest card, tear it off, and put it in that offering box at the back, we would love to just get to know you a little bit better. Uh, Raymond will reach out to you. Um, and uh, our pastor, of, uh, our, um, one of our pastors on staff here, he'll reach out to you and uh, let you know about more about our church. Uh, as far as announcements, there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, you can look at it here. Next week we're having a fundraiser breakfast um, for the proceeds to go to Merrimack Area Chaplaincy Coalition. And so you can see that there. Lots of other exciting things. The Food on the Move trailer will be out there tomorrow morning. 
Um, and uh, there's some more information on that out at the welcome booth. Today we're taking up a dollar offering uh, for the benefit of uh, the, uh, the, the terrible tragedy, the victims, uh, the things happening there and with Hurricane Helene. Helene. And so uh, whatever you can give towards that, there's a dollar, $20, $100, uh, whatever it is, whatever you feel led to give, I'll say it that way. You can put it in the box back there. Um, uh, we're going to give it to Samaritan's Purse, um, and that's where donations are going to go to because we truly believe in what they do, and they have a great disaster relief team. They're in that area. They know who needs the help and the best way to scare it, and we trust them. And so that's why we're going to give these proceeds to them as well, all right? So be sure and give if you can there. So uh, I get to do double duty today, just to uh, let you know, Josh was supposed to be here this morning, Josh, uh, but he had a huge fever yesterday, like 104.1, and so we said, stay home, <laughs> and um, we said, we love you, <laughs> but stay home. Now, nah, he, he's uh, doing better, but he, he just was not feeling good, and so, um, and so I got to be here with you this morning. All right, so um, I'm going to pray, and then uh, we're going to watch a little video on Operation Christmas Child. Bob did a great job putting it together, Bob and Josiah, so let's pray. Father, we just give you praise. Thank you for bringing us here together today to honor you and to lift high the name of Jesus. Speak to us today. We're so grateful for everything that you've done for us. What a privilege it is to be here. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, church family. Hey, it's Operation Christmas Child time of year again. We've got about six weeks to see how many boxes God would allow us as a church to be able to provide in one form or another. Today in your bulletin, you'll notice an insert, and that insert will show you everything that you can pack and especially things that you don't want to pack because shipping can be a little rough on certain items as we put it in. So it's going to be an exciting time. After you grab that bulletin insert, you'll walk outside this door just as if you're leaving church and over here, you'll notice a great table set up. There'll be somebody here to be able to help you. You'll be able to grab a box, maybe two, three, as the Holy Spirit lays it on your heart, other information that you may need, and then be able to pack a box. What an opportunity to be able to take your kids, your grandkids to a store, grab some items, and from your kitchen table, have a mission trip that'll end up on the other end of the world with a child being able to hear the gospel. That's the how, but I want to especially tell you the why. I went online the other day with Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse. I noticed that they're sending these boxes to 127 different countries around the world, many that aren't even mentioned in addition to that because of security reasons, and people are going to hear the gospel for the first time. In each one of these settings, there's a church that is at one of those locations where children will be receiving boxes for follow-up in place, and then Samaritan's Purse will insert in their heart language the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to be an exciting time, great follow-up. It's a great plan. Pray and see if God will allow you to be a part. Psalm 127 one talks about the Lord, uh, bu Lord building our house. If the Lord builds our house, it can't be moved. Let's stand as we sing together.
commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Good morning, good morning. Um, so we're in Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah chapter 2. My name is Jeff, I'm one of the pastors here. If you're visitors with us, I didn't introduce myself a while ago, so I thought I would take time to do that. And so I'm excited to be with you guys here this morning. Again, we're in the book of Nehemiah. We just started last week. Norm kind of laid the foundation, uh, uh, kind of set the course, gave, a, the, you know, gave us the, the pieces of uh, helping us to understand uh, the scriptures here. And so we appreciate that. If you missed it, you can always go back online and look at it on the YouTube. Um, so um, I've read, this week I heard about this uh, bird named Chippy. And uh, Chippy was a parakeet who loved to sing, did a lot of singing. And... Uh, <laughs> The owner, uh, one day, her owner, the owner, pet's owner, uh, was doing some vacuuming and decided to vacuum out the bottom of Chippy's cage. And so she stuck the vacuum in the bottom and started vacuuming it out. The phone rang. She reached to grab the phone, and something happened, and poof, Chippy was sucked into the vacuum cleaner. That sounds awful, doesn't it? So she loved her bird. She started panicking, humped the phone, tore the vacuum cleaner apart, and there was Chippy inside the vacuum, but he's still alive. And so she instantly saw he's all, you know, he's still alive, he's covered in dirt. So she grabbed him, ran to the bathroom, held him under the faucet, trying to clean him out. You know, turned the faucet on high, trying to clean out all the feathers and all the dirt and dust and all the junk that's in the vacuum cleaner. Finally got that all done. She's holding the bird up. No sees he's all wet and he's kind of shivering. So she grabs her hair dryer and decides to blow him, blow, blow the hair dryer and use the hair dryer to blow all the, <laughs> all the water off. Anyway, uh, true story is it happened in Minnesota. So a reporter follows up on her a couple of days later. He heard a story, he followed up, and said, how's Chippy doing? And she said, well, he's doing fine. He's still alive. He's doing fine. He just doesn't sing like he used to. And uh, I'm like, I get it, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, if you've been through what that bird been through, you probably wouldn't sing anymore either. And I thought, man, what a, it's, a, it's a great picture for us, right? In life, man, we're, we're beat down. You know, uh, life just comes hard at you, you know, and it has a tendency, if we aren't careful, to rob us of our song, right? To rob us of our joy. Um, and, and ultimately, we go through difficult seasons. We really do. Um, but we know that the Lord is faithful. Um, here lately, uh, if you're like me, it's easy to get discouraged by all the stuff going on. Um, if you didn't know it, there's an election coming. Um, if you didn't know there was an election, wherever you live, I want to find out because I want to hide there too because this, it's all over the place. Serious issues facing our nation. I will say this is a pivotal or consequential election. Um, and so I encourage you to get out to vote, all right, um, and represent truth and righteousness in the Word of God and let those things reflect in your voting. Um, but that's important. But, I, but if you look at just the, the condition, condition of our nation, the candidates, those type things, you know, and then some of the other things happening, homelessness uh, is skyrocketing, the Hurricane Helene, the terrible destruction that's happened there, and some of the response to it is just awful. It's awful. Inflation, and I know they try to say it's still not, in, you know, it's, we're, we're doing much better, but, you know, ultimately we're not. Um, and then, of course, there's abortion. And um, I could go on and on about the, there's a, there's an amendment, it's called a three, to permit abortion, um, uh, make it a constitutional amendment uh, for abortion to be uh, allowed in the state of Missouri, which as a church, we, we stand on the word of God, we believe life begins at conception, man, we're unashamed about it. You know, um, and if you've walked now, if you've walked through that season, we love you. We don't judge you because who, you know, all of us are sinners. All of us have made mistakes. All of us deserve uh, to be separated from God forever. But by His grace and mercy, He loves everyone, and so we love you too. I I do stand in judgment over a nation that celebrates abortion. I'm just being honest with you. Okay, it's not a thing to be celebrated. It's a thing to be mourned. 
what a terrible price it's cost. We, we love life. God is the author of life, and he loves life. And so um, I want to encourage you that. I do want to, the reason I kind of even bridge it up is um, in, um, uh, I went to, this past week we went to the uh, a fundraiser for um, Pre- Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center. And it was in, it's in Cuba. And uh, my father-in-law was on the board for that for five years, uh, served there. He was near and dear to his heart, um, believed in doing everything he could to help, uh, you know, especially women in crisis to choose life. Um, and that's why that center's there, is to really help. And so I think it's good for us to vote. We absolutely should do that. Um, but even more, I think it's great for us to go above and beyond and help people who are in crisis, who are, you know, maybe thinking about making a, a terrible decision, not just for that child, but for them, you know, that, that we can help them and encourage them to choose life, right? And so I thought it was a great thing. But he, the reason I'm telling you that, he shared some things about this uh, Amendment 3 and um, that are just absolutely awful. So not only is it terrible, but it's just an awful, it's an awful law. And so um, I would hope that you understand the, 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 the gravity of this situation. Now, of course, there's uh, sex trafficking, all these terrible things happening. And if you just looked around and saw the condition of, this, the, uh, of our country, the moral decay, you, it, you could easily get discouraged. You really could. This is written about America. America is in a sad and sickened state. There's great luxury on the part of few, great poverty on the part of many. Crime rates are soaring. Violence is common everywhere. City streets are unsafe. Free love is a spouse, and the home seems to be on the verge of collapse. Economic instability haunts the nation. Corruption and injustice same, shamelessly walk hand in hand in high places. Boy, if that's true. Racial division separates family and friends. Many wonder if the land of the free and the home of the brave is not writing its last chapter in history. I feel that way, right? Sometimes you think, man, are we even going to we even make it? Now, the crazy thing is, is this was written in the 1850s, <laughs> all right? So first off, I say there's nothing new under the sun, right? Sin is sin. It's been around, right? Um, but, but God has, has rescued, by the grace of God, he's rescued his time to having it because he sends a revival. Because his people pray and seek him for revival. The reason I'm even pointing to the 1850s, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a bit, is a great revival took place during that decade. And lives were changed. People came to faith in Jesus. And I believe God wants to do it again. I absolutely believe that. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. It seems like it's going to be tomorrow. I'm going to be honest with you. I see the condition of the world, things lining up. It sure seems like it's going to happen any time. But until that time, we have work to do. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We have work to do to share the gospel and to pray and see God. So if you get discouraged, remember, Chuck Colson said this. I thought it was really good. He was a part of the Watergate scandal, got, went to prison, but he got saved. Life was changed. He went on to serve God and do some really amazing, awesome things in a prison ministry. Um, he's gone now, but he said this 30 years ago. Where's the hope? I mean, millions who tell me they feel demoralized by the decay around us. Where is the hope? The hope that each of us has is not in who governs us or what laws are passed or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope is in the power of God working through the hearts of people. That's where our hope is in this country. That's where our hope is in life. That's right. Our hope is in God. And so there is hope. And so even though we look around and we see the terrible things, and I, I kind of like wallowing in misery a little bit. I'm just being honest with you. And I look around and I see the terrible things like, oh, it's so awful. I like complaining about it, right? I love complaining about it. But we have to remember there's hope. There's hope. And now is the time for God's people to get involved and serve and pray and seek him for revival. I absolutely believe that. And so we're talking about Nehemiah. We're looking at his life the things that he did, the, the choices he made to bring revival, if you want to call it that, back to the land of Israel. We're going to look at some of those things, right? And so maybe you need God to do a work in your life. Maybe you need a, a, a time of refreshing for God to do a miraculous work in you. Maybe you need God to work in your family. Or maybe you're like me and you want to see God bring a great work in this nation. We're going to look at the things that Nehemiah did and see if there's anything that we can glean from him, how we, what we need to do to prepare for revival, okay? First thing we're going to look at, the first thing we need to do is this. We need to get in the game. We got to get in the game. I like this. Put me in, coach. Here I am. Send me. It's kind of the mentality. Let's look at some scriptures. Um, chapter 1, verse 11 says this. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of the man. So what he's talking about his services, he's saying, give me success, right? Um, and grant me favor in the presence so I can get into, into this guy, the presence of the king. And then he's in verse uh, Five of chapter 2, he says, and if I answered the king, he's talking to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in his sight, then let him send me so that I can rebuild it. He's not saying, 
send, uh, you know, somebody from the administration. He's not saying, send my buddy, you know, who, who's also Jewish, who lives here and who could go back and do it. He's saying, I want to go. I want to be the one involved. He's getting in the game. He's putting skin in the game saying, I want to go. Send me. It's kind of like, here's Isaiah, you know, here am I. Send me. That is to be our attitude because as long as we're sitting on the sidelines, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. I realize that it's easier to do that. I really do. It's the path of least resistance. But as long as we continue in that, we're going to keep seeing the same things happening over and over and over again. And I know that's, that's not what's on your guys' heart. You guys are like me. You want to see revival. You want to see people set free from all of this terrible things taking place. And so we're going to follow along here. So um, Danny Cox, he was a fighter pilot, you know, jet fighter pilot. And he became a businessman, ultimately wrote a book called Seeds of Day. Anyway, in the book, he talks about this. He gives this illustration of whenever they were transitioning from propeller airplanes to jet fighters. They had to come up with a new system to uh, find a way to, uh, for ejection, you know, saying to get the pilot out because planes crash. And so it was a lot different, you know, <laughs> speeds are a lot faster, all those type things. And so um, they, they came up with this system, uh, and that was kind of similar to what we see today, where the canopy goes off, and then the, the seat, the pilot sitting in, shoots up out of the jet fighter, out of the jet. And then um, what was supposed to happen, the way it was designed first, was the pilot was to let go of the seat. And then his parachute would deploy, and he would, he would you know, fall, come down safely. But the, one of the things they found out in testing is pilots weren't letting go of the seat, which I kind of get it, right? You're, you're flying through the air, thousand, who knows how fast, you're shot up into the sky, right? Like, I don't know, I'm hanging on for dear life too, right? I, I, I get it, who knows? It, it might have been even a, an automatic response, like they couldn't let go of it even if they wanted to. And so they had to redesign the system. So they came up with a system, right, to... Um, uh, to uh, basically it was this webbing and it goes from the top of the seat to the bottom of the seat and the pilot sits on it. And so what happens is, you know, terrible things happen, right? Catastrophe happens. The pilot's shot up out of the plane and then two seconds later, depending on altitude and all those things, a cartridge fires and it launches the, dry, the pilot out of the seat so that the parachute can properly deploy. Man, that guy's getting like shot up. <laughs> like, man, there's a reason why I'm not a jet fighter pilot. But anyway, but anyway, right? I mean, it's, that's what it took them to get them out of that seat. And so the bottom line is this. What will it take to launch us out of our seat? What, what's it going to take for God, for, for God to do for us to go, oh, it's time for me to get in the game. Now, I know you guys. I know you guys love Jesus. And I know that you're all, a lot of you serve in our church. And, and just, I'm just so thankful for that, right? But it's time. This is, this is time now for us to get in the game. And get busy doing the work the Lord's called us to do. Because ultimately, if we do nothing, nothing will happen. We won't see God move in our lives. We won't see God move in the family, churches. We won't see God move in our nation. And so we need to get in the game. Number two is seek God. In chapter 1, verse 4, and we see an example of this also in chapter 2, verse 4. Verse, uh, chapter 1, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, so I prayed to the God of heaven. The first thing he did, seek God, right? He was willing to go. He seek God. And so uh, Norm did a fantastic job talking about prayer. So I'm not going to be labor prayer. We could talk all day about that. But I think one thing we all understand is this. God answers prayer. And, and, and we are more powerful when we're praying um, than anything. I, I, I believe we could see things, God do amazing things if we pray. And I think every single one of us believe that, so I'm not going to belabor it. I just want to encourage you, pray. I know sometimes it takes rough times to drive us to our knees, right? And sometimes it happens. And even that's an act of grace, I'm going to be honest with you. When, when God allows some, some, some tragedy or some, some rough times to go through, um, he's just trying to push you out of that chair and get you onto your knees to seeking him and praying. And so I encourage you to pray and seek God for your family and for this nation. All right. Uh, number three, you got to be patient. Um, now, just so you know, I have no patience whatsoever. I'm just being honest with you up here. I am worst, uh, one of the worst about being patient. Um, and I, you see this big long line here. I found this picture of an airport. And I want to tell the story. When we flew back from El Salvador, uh, we landed in Houston, and you got to go through customs. And we were in this huge long line, and we weren't even around the corner to where the actual lines usually start, right? So I was like, oh, this is awful. We had to get to our plane. 
we come out, one of our students left his passport on the plane. And so I was like, ah, oh, I, mean, I was freaking out. I'm going to be honest with you. I was trying to make calm in front of him, but I was like freaking out. But anyway, we, so we go back. They won't let us go to the plane. We got to trust them to go back and get it. So we wait off to the side. Anyway, they go find it. They bring it to us. And they're like, okay. And they move us to the front of the line on the opposite side. And we go right through. I was like, that was awesome. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to try that again. But anyway, because <laughs> I have no patience whatsoever. Look, check this out here. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, this is chapter 1, verse 1. Um, he says, I was in Citadel. And then he says, in the month of Nisan, this is chapter 2, verse 1. I was in the 20th year, is King Artaxerxes. So um, uh, Kislev uh, corresponds with our December. Nisan, if I'm saying that right, corresponds with our April. So about four months' time span took, happened between these two events, right? Of when he first heard about it until now he's getting ready to ask the king. So four months. Now, to me, four months does not sound like a very long time, does it? Right? But when you're in that, four months is forever. It, it really is. And so I just, I, I wrestled with patience. I was trying to figure out a way to illustrate how bad I am about it. And I, I, I was reminded of this. Uh, so pop quiz, four cars pull to a stop sign at the same time. Who goes first? You always say the one on your right, but it's always the one on your right. And so eventually nobody goes. I saw this picture, and I saw some people commenting on Twitter. One of them said, the first one to finish texting. I thought, okay, that's, okay, that's funny right there, because that's the truth, right? But the whole reason I'm even showing you all this is because this is me right here, the one who gets tired of waiting. So I, I've shared this with you before. A lot of times I pull up to a stop sign. If somebody else pulls up at the same time, right, I know it's supposed to be the person on your right, all this kind of stuff. You know what I do? I just go. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Like, I just go because I have no patience to wait and go, no, you go, no, you go, no, you go. And then I start to go, and then he starts to go, and then we both stop, and we're both, ah. And so nobody goes, right? I have no patience for that. I just go, right? And I say, hey, see you at church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But by the way, I drive a, I drive a gray Honda Accord, just so you know. <laughs> but I, I've, it's hard. Waiting is hard. Um, but sometimes God has to put us in his waiting room. Because his timing is perfect. And we just have to trust his timing. And so, but it's not easy. But whenever God's timing works, I, I, I didn't share this with the other services, but we had our pastors and wives retreat um, this weekend. And one of the pastors who was there, we were just kind of sharing stories, God's stories. And, um, and so he was talking about how they moved to a new church and a new community and, and they needed a place to live. And they drove past this house that was for rent, and it looked like a great house. It's perfect. You know, and in his mind, he's like, it meets everything we need. Let's just rent it. And his wife's like, no, let's just wait. Let's just, let's just wait. He's like, but it's what we need. It's where we need it. Da, 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 da. And she's like, let's just wait. And so he decides to listen to his wife <laughs> and, and, gives, and, and just be patient. So a week later, um, somebody in the church has some friends, and they're like, uh, he ends up meeting these people, and, you know, it was like death in a family or something, and they had this huge house on 1,800 acres. <laughs> 1,800 acres. I didn't even know they had farms that big in Missouri. Anyway, 1,800 acres, um, and they're looking for somebody to kind of live, you know, to move into it and, and, and rent it out. And so he goes and pe uh, meets with these people who own the house, and basically they're like, you can live here if you'll cut the grass. And, you know, not the whole 1,800 acres, but you can live here if you cut the grass. He said, man, it was a perfect house. There was a lake. There was all these tracks, like everything they needed. It was like this beautiful. He says, and we would have missed it all if I would have just done immediately what I was going to do. But by the grace of God, I listened to my wife. I was let, just gave, gave it some time, and God opened this door. Didn't even have to pay rent. And so sometimes it's hard to be patient. But sometimes God puts it. Ultimately, Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. 37, 7, be still before the Lord, wait patiently for him. I know, it's, waiting is not easy. But um, we learn in God's waiting room that he's always working behind the scenes. And if you've experienced this in your life, you've seen God do this, you feel like nothing's happening. All the while, God is moving. God is working. He's making things happen. He's setting things up in place for just the right time. And so we just have to trust him and resist the urge to run ahead of God. Number four, count the cost. All right, chapter two, verses one through three say this. In the month of Nisan, 20th year king of Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. 
very perceptive. I was very much afraid. So take note of that. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins? Its gates have been destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah is terrified, right, for allowing himself to be sad in the presence of the king. You say, Jeff, why is that? Because palace etiquette said that all servants were to always look happy in the presence of the king. Because remember, being in the king's presence was going to produce joy. <laughs> you know, laugh, laugh, funny, funny. You know, but, but you understand what I'm saying? So, and, and, and I get it. He's trying to run the kingdom. The last thing he needs are grumpy Gus is a negative Nancy. He's coming in and going, me, 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 you know, complaining about everything. That's the last thing he wants. And so um, it, was, it was treasonous. And you know the penalty for this? <laughs> they would have killed you. They'd put you to death. They'd take you out and hang you, put you to death, whatever it was. And so he knew this could happen. But instead of, you know, shirking back in fear and cowering in fear, he steps forward in faith. And he says, this is what I'm going to do. And he says, King, this is what I need. And he allows this. So he knew what the cost was ahead of time, but he did it anyway. And so we too have to count the cost. It'd be tempting to say, oh, oh, King, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, 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 I won't ever let it happen again, you know, and to cower in that moment. But in that moment, he took this step of faith, knowing it could cost him his life. But he, more, he thought it was more important to see revival come to his land, right, than even his own safety. So if you step out in faith and you seek God for a work in your life, a work in your family, a work in revival, um, there, there, could, there will be a cost. It may be friends. It may be family. It may be a job. I'm, I've heard all the stories. Maybe you have too. Uh, a youth talked to me one time and, and mentioned about how uh, he really wanted to honor God, and so he was starting to kind of you know, disassociate or distance himself some, from some friends that didn't honor God. And so, man, it's, I said, man, it's awesome. Praise God. And he says, but the problem is, this whole reason he's talking, he said, the problem is, is I don't really have any godly friends that are nearby. He says, I have some, but they're distant. And, you know, they're, they live far away. And so he was having this problem. Like, he, he was doing the right thing, but he didn't have any necessarily godly friends. And so we prayed together, and I said, man, when you honor the Lord, he will bless you. He will make a way. He will provide godly friends to encourage you. And so I said, pray and seek God um, in this moment. And so the list goes on. I could go on and on about things that could happen whenever we take a step of faith. All right, number five, have a plan. This is uh, two, chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Here's some of it. It says, the king said to me, what is it you want? He says, I pray to the God of heaven. We call this an emergency SOS prayer. Of course, it was backed up by four months of prayer. Anyway, he says, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with a queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beans for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. He had a plan. I don't think this all happened off the top of his head. You know, he didn't go in there, oh, I'll give it a shot, you know. And then the king said, hey, okay, what do you want? He's like, well, let me think. Okay, first, I'm going to need, I guarantee you, he knew exactly what he was going to ask for when this moment came. And so during his time of praying and fasting, he also developed a plan. And, um, and it may have looked something like this. I don't know. I just started writing down here. Step one, convince the king, which, which, by the way, we talk about the gracious hand of God. If you look back in the book of Ezra, you got Ezra and then Nehemiah, okay? Ezra led the first group back. They rebuilt the temple. They started to rebuild the walls, but they encountered opposition. That person sent a message to the king and said, make it stop. The same king here, okay? This is King Artaxerxes looked in the history of Israel, said, well, they, they, they could be a nuisance. Stop building the walls. And so now Nehemiah is saying, oh, by the way, king, the one that you didn't want us to build, we're going to build those walls. I mean, think about it. It was, a, it was a gracious hand of God that made this happen. And so you can see there some of the plans. He says, king, by the way, not only am I going to build the wall, will you pay for it? All right, so that was pretty cool. Procure letters, work out a deal, ask the king, and then ultimately begin discretion. So I, I bring this up to say, listen, if you want God to work in your life, have a plan. Because there are some things that only God can do. It's the truth. Only God brings revival, right? I can't make a revival. We can't make a revival happen. 
Only God can send heaven-sent Holy Ghost revival. That's the truth. Um, I can't do a work in you. Only God can do the work. But there are things that we need to do. We have responsibilities, actions and steps that we need to take to prepare for God to do these things. And so maybe you want God to work in your life. I would say, here's maybe some steps. Download the Bible app. Get a Bible study. Set an alarm for prayer time and Bible study. Maybe it's, uh, I, uh, Bob talked about this in the staff meeting the other day. Um, we often think set an alarm, we mean 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, well, I mean, that's not the best time. Maybe 2 p.m. in the afternoon is the best time for you to do a prayer and Bible study. That, that's what it is, right? Set a time. Uh, find someone to hold you accountable. That's really good as well. Find a quiet place I, down by the river and then throw your phone in the river, right? Maybe that'll help out. Um, okay, maybe just delete social media at least or pause it or something. Something to help you focus in and hear from God. Um, volunteer to help a church. Man, plug in. Be willing to serve. Say, God, I want to serve at church. And come and talk to one of the staff here and find out opportunities for serve. And then go on a mission trip. If you want God to do something in your life, those are things that you're going to do. How about if you want to you see your family? You want to see God do a work in a family? You have a family meeting. Say, God, or say, family, this is what we're doing, all right? We're going to get on the right track. And then have family devotions and, and pray with the family. Take them to church. Get them plugged. Get the kids plugged in. Awana as a student group. And I would say do fun things as a family. Maybe even take a family mission trip. And finally, if you're like me and you want to see revival, maybe these are some steps that we can do. Set up a special time for prayer. <clears throat> I would say separate of even your regular prayer time. I know you all in here, you're, you're prayer warriors, man. You, got, you, you study the Bible, you pray. I would say even separate of that, set an alarm at some point in your day and say, and just pray for this nation. Um, maybe even doing some fasting and praying. Join with others in prayer. And I would say um, outside of our church. Find and start a prayer group, maybe at your job, maybe at the school, wherever you're at, organization club, start a prayer group. Maybe, I don't care if it's two or three people, start a prayer group. The reason I tell you about that is because in 1857, there's this thing called the Fulton Street Prayer Meeting, and it was exciting. A businessman decided he wanted to pray for the city, so he said he gathered a few guys, and they decided to have prayer. God began to work. More people came. People were getting saved. They weren't even preaching. But people were getting saved at these prayer meetings because God was pouring out His Spirit. Other places around the nation heard about it. They too started prayer meetings. God began to move a huge revival. In that year alone, they say over a million people came to faith in Christ because of prayer meetings. I, I think about at the same time frame, Battleship North Carolina was parked there in uh, New York Harbor. And four, four men, four sailors um, decided, over a thousand sailors on this boat, four of them decided they want to have a prayer meeting. And so they found a room, they were given a room down at the very bottom of the ship, and they began to pray. And after a few times of praying, the Holy Spirit just came down on them, on them guys, and man, they got excited. They started shouting and singing and singing praise to God and just singing glorious hymns and just giving God praise. Well, the other sir, uh, sailors heard them, right? And they're like, okay, we're going to see what's going on. And he went down to make fun of these guys. Well, they got down there, Holy Spirit came down, came on up, they got under conviction, they realized they needed Jesus, so they started repenting of sin. So then more and more sailors were getting saved. There were so many sailors getting saved at this time, they had to reach out to churches in the, in the New York City area to come and help and send counselors to this boat because so many sailors, young men, were getting saved. And so I would say, join, join in prayer with others. Start a little prayer meeting. Prayer walk, community, share the gospel. Start a Bible study. Invite people to church. Those are the things that we're going to do if we truly want to see God work in this nation, get set free from all this bondage and decay. These are some of the things that we're going to do. All right. Um, I don't have a lot of time to keep going. We'll just kind of jump past these. There, are, there comes a time when it's time to go. Chapter 2, verse 9. I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. He'd done his plan. He'd sought God, gathered the supplies, and then he went. And there will be a time when you've got to go. There will be a time when you've got to take that step of faith and step out and do it. And then finally, expect opposition. We'll talk more about this next week. But chapter 2, verse 10 says this. When Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed. And so, dun, dun, dun. You guys already did that. Um, because all of a sudden, the devil is not going to give up territory easily. I'll just say it that way. And so when you and I set out to build God's kingdom, right, he's going to fight back. And so expect opposition. 
All right, well, I'll finish with, finish with this. Um, going back to Chippy here, uh, the singer, right? Um, so I'm, I just, you know, God kind of put on my heart to share this, you know, and just being real with you guys a little bit. Um, and so um, for ever since I, you know, surrendered to Christ, um, this unique thing happened. And I'll, I'll say I got a song in my heart, okay? So every morning, this is how it kind of shows up. Every morning when I wake up, there's a song in my head. I'm singing a song literally every morning for years. I don't even, I couldn't tell you, it started shortly after surrendering to Christ, and it's happened every day since. And it's usually a gospel song, Christian song, worship song. Um, one time there was a Taylor Swift song. Don't know how that happened, all right? Just being honest with you. Being honest with you. It's not like I listened to Taylor Swift, but it's somehow it ended up in there. So, um, but it's this neat thing, right? That every morning I wake up song, song in my heart. Well, this past week on Tuesday, um, I was hanging out with my daughter, she had a doctor's appointment, and she was showing me a video of her and her friends, and uh, they were at a college, uh, she's in college, they were going to an archery tournament, they were in the van, and they were singing a Carrie Underwood song, Top of Her Lungs, right? And I'm like, man, that looks so much fun. I remember when I was in college, man, you didn't care, you just drive along, everybody's singing, the good times. So anyway, we go about our day. The next morning I woke up, and I was singing a Carrie Underwood song. I dug my key into the side of his pretty little souped up four-wheel drive, carved my name to his letter. I, I was singing, I'm like, ah, and I called her and said, you made me. But it dawned on me, right, because I've been going through this season, that song had been missing from my life. Not necessarily that song, but that, that morning, that morning song had been missing from my life. I don't even know when it went away. But I've been going through a rough season, right? And, um, and, and I'm not trying to say I put on a brave face or that kind of stuff, but, but you know how this is. If you've been through this type of thing, you just understand there's just, everything just kind of blah, right? And it's just really, and I, I never experienced anything like this in my life before. Some of you have been through this season. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a, a dark, like cloudy season. And so my song was gone, and I didn't even realize it until that day. So Friday, um, we had the Pastors and Wives Conference, Bob, Roger, all the guys did a fantastic job. We sit over there, and uh, Friday night, I'd worked on this all day Friday, kind of finishing things up, and, and I remember, you know what, I'm going to pay attention, because I got me thinking about this, I said, I'm going to pay attention to what song's on my heart Saturday morning, and see if it's back. And I woke up, and there was a song. <laughs> it's a great song, I'll share it with you in a moment. But um, um, I, was just, I was just celebrating, you know, and I was happy about it. But I wasn't necessarily going to share it, all right? Um, but, la- but Saturday night, last night, as I was working on these things, I just, you know, God said, tell them. Tell them. Tell them about what happened. And so I wanted to share with you the song that God uh, put in my heart to sing Saturday morning. Um, and um, it's called Speak to the Mountains. And here's some of the words. It says, why would I worry when giants come calling my name? My God is bigger than troubles I face. Why would I hunger for power, riches, or fame? Because my God is so much better than all of those things. So I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. So I'll speak to the mountains. Oh, it's time to move because my God is bigger, better, stronger, greater than you. There's other lyrics there. I'm just going to skip down. Here's a bridge. There's no mountain too high, no valley too low. There's no fear that I have. He doesn't already know. There's no problem too big. There's no weapon too strong. There's nothing for God that's impossible. And then this chorus rang through my head. So I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. So I speak to the mountains. It's time to move. Because my God is bigger, better, stronger, greater. He repeats this line over and over. He says, my God is bigger, better, stronger, greater. Bigger, better, stronger, greater than you, mountain. My God is bigger. And so I found some freedom. He wants the same thing for you. I don't know what you're going through today. Maybe you're in that dark season. Maybe that cloud is hanging over your head. Maybe you're dealing with some loneliness. Maybe you're dealing with some addiction. I don't even know. But I know God wanted me to share this with everybody today. Because he wants to bring healing in your life. He wants you to know that he loves you. And he has not left you. Right? He has not departed you. He's not left you alone. He sees what you're going through, and he wants to bring some relief and some peace and some joy into your life. Let's pray.
God, we give you praise. You are so awesome. You're slow to anger, abounding in love. And I just give you praise for that today. I thank you for your mercy that's new every morning. And I thank you for joy that comes when we meet Jesus. Father, you know that there are difficult seasons in our life. All of life is about seasons. And some seasons are good and some seasons are just really tough. And God, you know that. But you're faithful. And you're bigger and you're better and you're stronger and you're greater than anything that we're going to face. Any mountain that we're going to face, you're bigger than all those things. And we just say that. Now, Father, if there's someone here today who is walking through this and they just need to hear from you this morning, I pray that you just touch them right now. God, let them feel your presence and know that you love them very much. That you've not forgotten them, you've not left them. But you are right there. Just let them feel your love this morning. Father, for, for, if there's someone here who's never professed faith in Christ, help them to have the courage to take the step of faith and say, Jesus, I give my life to you. Father, bless this time as we, as we seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all stand. And every head bowed, every eye closed, right? Everybody stand up. Dave's going to play some music here. And I would just say, let's just take a moment and seek God, right? Let's just take a moment and call out to him. And maybe you got some sin you need to deal with. Maybe you got some hurts. Um, maybe you want to sing again, right? Uh, maybe life's been tough. And, and I tell you what, God loves you very much. And I would just say, talk to him about it this morning. Just pour out your heart to him. Or maybe... I would say pray for revival. Pray that God would just send revival and let it start with us. Let it start with us today. So uh, be sure to pray for each other this week. That's what we do as a church family. We pray for each other because none of us really know what each other's going through necessarily, right? And it doesn't mean the world's ending or that kind of stuff, but man, every single one of us, we're facing stuff, right? And I'm not saying we all need to come up here and just pour out all of our guts, right? I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying you never know what someone's going through, right? And so that's why we pray for one another as a church family. So uh, let me pray a blessing over everyone. Uh, don't forget, dollar offering on your way out for uh, Hurricane Helene victims. And so I encourage you to give towards that if you are able, um, as the Lord leads. But let me pray a blessing over everyone, and then we'll uh, sing our way out. God, uh, we give you praise. You're a great God. Thank you for all who are here. Father, bless them with joy and with peace and with excitement. Bless them with a the song a song to sing, a song of praise to you, for you're a great God. We love you, and we thank you for all you've done for us. Bless your people today as he sings in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God.